and welcome to part two of this Tech Talk. My name is Mike Lane, and I'm the Global Education and Inside Sales Manager for Hexagon Geospatial. If you missed part one, you can find it on the Hexagon Geospatial website under eTraining. I talked about the definitions and the differences between AI, machine learning, and deep learning, covered some of the industries in geospatial that are using AI today, and the benefits of exploring and implementing AI in your workflows. In part two, I will go into more specifics of the machine learning and deep learning algorithms themselves, how, I th how they are unique and differ from one another. I'll keep it pretty high level and provide an overview with some tips and tricks on which machine learning or deep learning algorithm to use when and for which data. But first, let's talk about the steps in the workflow itself. So the workflow is, first of all, gathering all of your training data. Then you need to select the attributes that you're going to use in the training. Next, you need to figure out which machine learning algorithm is best to use for the type of data that you have, as well as the application. And next, you need to train the system. Finally, after the system's trained, you can use that training to predict in data sets that the machine hasn't seen before. Now let's jump into some of the machine learning algorithms that are out there, what they are all about, and when they should be used for what type of data. So first is K nearest neighbors or KNN. And this algorithm assumes that similar things exist in close proximity with one another. So similar things are near one another. It's an instance-based algorithm, and what this means is that it does not generate models based on the training data. It saves the training data information, and then when it's doing the prediction, it compares the new data to the training data to actually make the prediction. It's done based on a similarity feature um, of instances in the training data, and what it is really good for is for uniformly sampled data. The next one is CART, which is probably one of the more commonly known uh, machine learning algorithms. It's a regression tree. And what this means is it's a decision tree that branches off and each of the branches represents a choice between a certain number of alternatives. Each leaf then represents the ultimate decision. And these decisions continue to fork until the right prediction or the best prediction is made for each record. CART is simple and easy to understand, so that's why it's one of the most commonly used ones, um, as well as it's less influenced by outliers and anomalies. So it's really good for classifying your data that is noisy. Here is what a decision tree algorithm will look like in terms of each branch representing a decision and then ultimately then the leaves represent the decision of that prediction. The next is random forest and in random forest we grow multiple trees as opposed to a single tree in the cart model and these trees are independent of one another. Each tree gives a classification result and we say that the tree votes for the class. And just like in an election, the forest chooses the class that has the most votes. Random forest is used across all different dif disciplines, not just geospatial. And if you're having difficulties figuring out which one to use, you should start with this classifier. Next is Naive Bayes. This is a classification technique based on the Bayes theorem that assumes independence among the predictors. So this classifier assumes that the presence of a particular feature in a class is unrelated to the presence of any other feature, that your data isn't connected in any way. When this assumption is there, this classifier performs better compared to other models and it actually requires less training data as well. Support vector machines, or SVM, is based on finding a hyperplane that separates classes. It works really well when there is a clear definition and separation of your classes, but don't use this technique if the target classes are overlapping. 
for example, in vegetation where classes may be very similar, it will have a hard time differentiating. It also doesn't perform well on imbalanced or skewed training data sets as well. All the previous classifiers that I spoke about were machine learning supervised classifiers, meaning that they need training samples to learn from. This one is different. It is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, and it uses uh, clusters of data to separate classes into a set number of classes that we specify. You minimize the sum of the squares of the distances between the data points and their cor corresponding class centroids in order to create these clusters and identify a specific number of classes. Next, let's look at the deep learning workflow. It's similar to machine learning workflow, but without the selection of attributes. So deep learning workflow starts off with first gathering your training data. Next, you select the deep learning algorithm that you will use. Then you need to train the system. And then finally, step four is the classification or prediction. First, you need to decide which classes that you would like to extract or identify. And each one of those classes is put into a folder. So instead of like machine learning with decision trees, what we do is we extract training chips from the images. We give the examples of what an airplane in this example looks like. And we need to identify several different shapes, sizes, colors of the airplane so that the machine can understand exactly what we're looking for. So if we're looking for airplanes and or ships and cars, each one of those would go into a different folder. All the chips for the planes in one folder, all the image chips for cars in another folder. So the images need to represent what you're looking for. And unlike machine learning, we don't choose attributes. We create these chips uh, to identify our features of interest. After you've selected your training data, the next step in the workflow is to select the deep learning algorithm you wish to use. One option is Inception. And Inception is part of Google TensorFlow open source machine learning architecture. Inception is complex. It uses a lot of tricks to push performance, both with accuracy and speed. It has been evolving, so it has several different versions. One, version two, three, four, and also Inception ResNet. Depending upon your data, a different version might be more appropriate to perform your deep learning prediction. Uh, it is a module when a convolution neural network uses convolution kernels of multiple sizes, so multiple sizes as well as pooling within one layer. It's won awards for accuracy, and again, it is part of the Google uh, open source machine learning architecture. If you don't want to use Inception, another option is to create your own CNN model. To design your own, you'll need an input, hidden layers, and an output layer. The input layer is the input to the network. No computation is done in this layer. There are hidden layers, and these are where all the computations are performed. The input data is transformed through a series of operations to then generate the output layer and the output layer represents scores. So your input, there's only one, it's the image, where you'll need the size, the width and the height, and the number of bands or layers. The next are the hidden layers. And the hidden layers are first the convolutional layer. The learning starts here. Filters, so small patches of images that represent a feature, are convolved over the input image, which gives us a feature map. The filters are learned, they're not hard-coded. So if what we're looking for has a horizontal line, the filter might not figure that out right away that we're looking for that horizontal line, but during the training, it will learn that if it performs better, the filters will be weighted to detect horizontal lines as it moves forward and learns. The next hidden layer is the pooling layer. And this layer is supposed to downsample the feature maps that are created in the first convolutional layer. And this is to reduce complexity and to extract the prominent features of interest. 
Next is the activation layer. This takes the feature map and makes an activation map as an output. The next hidden layer is a flatten layer, which takes all the feature maps and converts them into a single one-dimensional feature vector. Then there are dense layers, and these are fully connected. That means every node in the previous layer is connected to every node in the next layer. And the purpose of this dense layer is to, one, introduce non-linear combinations of these features learned from convolution layers. So while most of the feature maps may be good at classification, a combination of these feature maps are probably going to yield a better result. And two, to use these features for classifying the input image into various classes based on the training data set. Finally, there's the output layer. There's only one output layer, and this layer will have the nodes equal to the number of possible outcomes. So when should you use deep learning versus machine learning? And here's a simple chart to help you. First of all, if you have a training data set that is small, machine learning is probably best. Deep learning requires a very large training data set. If you're going to be choosing your own attributes, you'll use machine learning. But if you're not, you can choose deep learning. The training time for machine learning is relatively short as opposed to training time for deep learning. And in terms of the CPU, GPU memory for the system and computer itself, machine learning usually takes a, uh, a standard machine while deep learning is computationally very heavy um, on, on your machine. To wrap up, AI, machine learning, and deep learning, there's many readily available algorithms embedded in remote sensing applications like Hexagon Geospatial's Erdas Imagine to try for yourself. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, create new AI algorithms. You can simply use those many that are available uh, and useful within these applications. There's lots of e-training and documentation available for you to do step-by-step, -step, watch videos, and learn more. If you are using imagery for any application, change detection or object detection, it's really great to get the most out of your imagery and the most return on investment by applying these newer technologies and machine learning. It's here to stay. It's the way of the future. So the more that you can learn now and apply, the more that you are ready for the amount of data that's going to be coming your way in the future. If you want to learn more, please contact us at Hexagon Geospatial. Thanks again for listening to part two of this two-part series. If you missed part one, you can find it at www.hexagongeospatial.com under the e-training section. Thank you again for joining and stay tuned for more Tech Talks by Hexagon Geospatial.